and especially the students who have always so um, graciously spearheaded all of this, actually. And very honored to be with him and here again. And well, thank y'all. Thank y'all all very much. Um, I'm always inspired by your words and your thoughts and the way your mind kind of like, you know, interweaves like different layers. So, I guess I want to talk to you a bit about um, something I call ceiling therapy, or which actually my son called, labeled ceiling therapy. Um, and I was like, you know, to me I see it more as poetic meditations through philosophy, but um, as Max quite, you know, poignantly said, um, Mom, you get this. Um, there are many layers to things. And you can experience this by like laying on your back and looking at the ceiling. And then traveling upward, and then upward again. And so through the ceiling, through the different layers, through the clouds, through the different um, layers that we know exist in this kind of space and energy time, um, whether they're physically visible or physically invisible behind the veil. So uh, much of Heraclitus' work has inspired my, my poetic work, and not only poetic work, but just really, um, I think we resonate with similar ideas, or I certainly resonate with his, some of his um, ideas and thoughts that still remain. And um, this whole multi-layered sense of being. Um, and I'd say it takes some time, some space you know, between my ears, if you will. Um, and so he was very, very bonded with the language, or he was very close with the language. And um, perhaps his, I think reading through some of the fragments, we understand that he talks about, or he actually has, he comes across as if like a, a prophet, like kind of a, or a Greek, Greek oracle, if you will, as almost if he's like kind of just channeling like this trick directly from I don't know thin air. And um, but he he bonded really closely with the language, and um, you know perhaps it, you know he was not formally he wrote in Ionian dialect um, as opposed to some of the other more. <coughs> Poetic poets, such as Xenophanes and um, Parmenides. But um, I don't know, I, I bond very, very closely with his, his thoughts and ideas, um, which have inspired. So, and, and I think the whole idea, that, the big idea, because he talked about many things, but the bigger idea of logos, or mythos, but particularly logos. Um, has, has multiple layers, at least from my perspective, how I understand it and translate it. And um, there are various, there are various layers between this everything and nothingness, or this beingness that is seemingly two but one. And um, we find some of these references that have trickled down through time from Heraclitus to, for instance, the Christian Judea Bible. And um, in the Gospel of John, they're, they're right. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was the, with God, and the Word was God. And, and certainly, this is a translation in English, and <clears throat> perhaps there's distortion, there has been distortion along the way. But I thought it was quite a curious statement. And this, to me, really kind of like hit the nail on the head that you know, his relationship, or Heraclitus' relationship with the language was um, you know, not only spiritual um, in a very organic way, very kind of originating from nature, but this has also been appropriated um, in various other scriptures, you know, not only in the Bible, but also through Vedic mythology, we find similar um, references to for instance, the word Om supposedly is the first word that was spoken by God and the wor world appeared. So it's a curious primordial understanding of language and what it can do. And I think we also, we often take for granted the power of words and what it, it does and does not do simultaneously, whether we're conscious or unconscious of how we wield those words. 
And um, so I think this logos of what Heraclitus was very keen on disseminating um, to us, to posterity, um, we find in fragment one. It says, it is wise to hearken not to me, but to my word, logos, and confess that all things are one. So this whole idea that seemingly multiple things are interwoven into one, and this whole oneness exists, kind of inspired this, this poem I'm going to read to you called Conjugating Life um, in, in sonic form. So, a cho choice of selection, like noun plus verb, a perfect fit, words breadeth in contemplation, spoken in conversation, said to be heard, or harmonizing union, seen at exhibition, pluralizing parts, linked by letters, murmured, per se uttered via thought, suggestion like love embracing the absolute or absurd, intrinsic synergy carved without denomination, female, male, or singular neutral, the A added to B's intersection, a form chelated as a compound, peace, love, and logos, life's epidural, sound and motion, frequency, tuned and vibration, assimilated by one as organic configuration. So in keeping with this whole idea of fragment one and oneness, that everything is connected, if you will, and that this sense of beingness, according to Heraclitus, we see throughout nature. Um, this poem called Consciousness was, was inspired. <clears throat> Lift up the stone and you will find me there. Look around and you will find me everywhere. See the creator and the creature. I am here as you are there. This is being. We are. And the first four lines of this poem were actually quoted from the Gospel of Thomas, as well as um, St. Francis. So I thought it was curious that you know, many of these thoughts, this, these trickle-down thoughts that perhaps originated from Heraclitus have found their, their way here and there and um, found us again um, through this whole perspective of um, separateness, which is actually one, oneness and um, through the power of the spoken word, actually, um, that we consciously speak into being and the understanding of. So, where shall we go from here? Yes. So the next poem, I'm going to read a part of it, actually. It is um, from my forthcoming, um, which is, should be out just, but not quite. Uh, it's a translation from English or into English verse from, um, from ancient Greek, and it's Cleanthes, um, a Stoic philosopher who was also very much inspired. The Stoics were inspired by Heraclitus' work. Um, so it's called Hymn to Zeus, and I'm particularly concerned in this particular case with the invocation um, of this particular poem, which I think. Um, there's kind of like, perhaps, in my perspective, some subversive message to basically to, to remind us how to, to speak things into being and how to kind of connect with, um, let's say, source, God, however you want, you'd like to label it. Um, as the Stoics, I will remind them, they didn't necessarily believe that you needed to pray, simply because you were to believe, you were, you were believed to be in um, a state of prayer vis-a-vis -vis divine logos, thought. So, um, anyway, so this is the invocation. Noblest one, called most powerful ruler you, Lord of nature, governing all by your divine law, Zeus. I call upon thee, it is just, any and all address you, our origin design bear likeness to your line like two, and we live, move as myriad creature, physical on earth, akin to you. 
So here we have this, this invocation to the, the divine through words, um, speaking into being this uh, divine logos, if you will. Um, So, fragment 36 of the remaining 126 fragments, and fragment 59, they actually talk about this duality, this, this the right, the left, the up, the down, the day, the night, and in, in fra fragment 36, um, he specifically um, says, God is day and night, winter and summer, war and peace, or fight and hunger, but God takes various form, just as fire, which is mingled with spices named according to the savor of each. And so, you know, you hear, you have this kind of, you know, he points us in this direction of understanding that this divinity is all around us, and it is everything um, in opposition, yet it is one. And this inspired very much, I mean, this next poem, um, which I will read for you, entitled uh, Space and Energy, um, something that I guess, I, something that's helped me as, as someone who really understands, who deals with architecture in a more abstract way, understand um, Heraclitus' um, perspective, perhaps with different labels, so Space and Energy. They are constant, these two, space and energy, they stew. Harmony within chaos, without ado, meat and potatoes into the pot, synergies of as truth's plot, or scent like marriage, together's lot. So the next poem I will will actually read is a, it's a short one. It is um, the form that I call a triptych, which is basically the Homeric epigram plus two, or basically some have noted that, you know, it, it simulates or references the ancient haiku. It is um, entitled Ouroboros, which is a mythological, mythological creature or perhaps just a metaphor for symbology. Connected from beginning to end, spherical, like serpent with mouth injected tail, visceral, infinite union of two to one, eternal. So the whole idea of fragment 69 talks about the beginning and the end of a circle's circumference as common or simply the same. And this whole idea of Heraclitus kind of understanding the two is one and one is two, or endings as beginnings and beginnings as ending, like a circle is this, this unity, this wholeness, which is constantly reverberated throughout his, the, the remains of his work that we have. Um, the next, the next um, poem I, I will read is, um, it was inspired very much by fragment 120, which talks about man's character is his fate. And um, I think there's a lot of truth there. Um, I'm going to read a poem that was part of a, my first collection called The Door. And it really kind of, really like these two ide ideas of, you know, your character or your fate is how you shape it. So the door. I admit it now. I moved it, the front door. But how did it affect, redirect today? The entrance, gateway of energy at play. The causeway willed for time and tomorrow. Did it change our hearts or mend our sorrows? The dance of Newton's atoms seemed for a stray. Actions, words, movement of time and space, whether we forgave, stole, begged, or borrowed. A willful decision turned left or right, the architect's dilemma. The ever song, 
It seemed safer, the door on that side, looking back now in retrospect or hindsight. All those years gone, 11, 12 years on, open the door. Do you think I was right? So this next poem, which is a sonnet, was actually inspired by a very curious question that I was asked after a talk I gave. And I didn't have an answer at the time, and I didn't, and I asked simply to say, um, I know that part of what you, you've asked, but I don't know all of it. And so I thought about it, and I came back, and I, I came back with what I thought was perhaps a perspective of um, the question that was asked. So, and it deals with the whole idea um, of opposites, the whole idea that, um, which, which interweaves like fragment 45 and, and 46. Um, this attunement between um, opposition, harmonics. What if the incapability of harmony exists? He asked. One of two, three or more entities that do not allow the flow but rather resist the harmonics of opposites of polarity. Yet within the imbalance, there is always the possibility to find, reallocate balance, even if the energy shrouds like dark hallways. Here one must align, realign with temperance. However, if you negate the law of polarity, it offers us proof, truth, and assurance that the desire to <clears throat> harmonize is the clarity from with, for it is within we delineate our self-resistance. Our outer world is a mirror of this inner place where we can redirect, reflect, harmonizing space. So, I'm gonna close on a poem that actually I wrote for this particular this talk today, and um, it's a triptych, uh, and it harkens this whole internal theme of beingness, which Heraclitus talks about, this whole idea that the past, present, future is simply just the eternal now, and there is no begin nor any ending, simply just being and the transformation of, so it's called forever. Must the four precede the ever, or the being is beyond never, like the eternal now, fire forever. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm very grateful. Would anybody like to ask any questions? I would like to ask a question, the, both the poets, and it has to do with how you write your poetry. Do you have the lines in your head and you say, I have these lines in my head, I'm going to write them down, or do you start writing and create as you go along? <coughs> can I stand up? I yes, you can stand up. Yeah. So that's a, that's a question I think about a lot. Um, Actually, so for me, there's probably three approaches, uh, and a line would more be a phrase. So if I have a phrase that seems worth writing down, especially since I'm generally writing, writing 14 month poems, um, that's probably the single most common method. Then an image. So and I walk, you know, I walk in the hills. Um, I do wind up writing a lot of nature poems, as someone recently pointed out. Um, in their review, but you know, um, I guess that's a deep level of interest. But so, so that could be a bird in flight, or some sound a bird makes, or it could be like a well, someday it might be a bear running across the road. Um, 
I once wrote a poem about mistakenly thinking a big black dog was a bear. That's as close as I've gotten. But so imagery and and and, lay, and and a phrase or a line, I think, are very common in poets. Just looking at what the results are. But the third, um, which is really an interesting concept and has fluctuated, I think, wildly in the history 